Hi kids, I'm Fred Kuhn. I play the banjo. I'm going to show you some different banjos through this video. My family settled in this country 300 years ago, and I learned banjo from my father, and he learned from his uncle Otis, and so forth, on back into the 1800s. The five-string banjo is called that because there are one, two, three, four, five strings. So that's a five-string. The strings each are tuned differently, so let me play them for you. You know, banjos can be made of all sorts of different woods. They can look different, but they all serve the same purpose. They are a drum head with a neck, and you can play them with strings. Here's an old banjo. This was one of my first banjos. It has, again, the five strings that you can see, but this head is made out of groundhog hide. So you can, you can make a banjo for most anything. This one happens to be walnut. When I was a kid, a little older than you, I used to go hunting with my dad and I hunted under this walnut tree. So when I timbered the farm, I had a banjo made from one of the walnut trees. That's this banjo. It's homemade too. What I'd like to do now is play you a tune. I want to tell you a little story about this tune, though. In the early days when they had the big paddle wheelers on the Mississippi, sometimes the trees would fall into the river and that big tap root that's way down under the ground would wind up on top, maybe just under the surface of the water. And if these boats didn't know where they were, those river pilots didn't know where they were, that boat could go over and that big tap root might cut a big hole, big jagged hole in the bottom of that boat. And that's called a Mississippi Sawyer. And so fiddle tunes and tunes that are played on the banjo, fiddle, and all of that in old time music have many funny names. This happens to be a tune called Mississippi Sawyer. <laughs> Thanks for watching, kids. Bye-bye. Hello, my name is Bruno, and I am playing for you the fiddle, a real important instrument in Appalachian music, and for good reason, sometimes the very centerpiece of the music. Fiddle can do so many different things. It can play a real pretty melody. Or it can play music that makes you want to jump right up and dance. Or it can make sounds that you recognize from somewhere else, like maybe like a train going by. Or like a chicken from out in the yard. <laughs> so you can see, 
Fiddle can uh, do an awful lot of things, and because it can play more than one note at a time, it can sound like a whole band all by itself if it needs to. And that was real handy back in the mountains when to entertain themselves and have a good time. People didn't have a computer or phone or TV or an iPod to play music. And they might invite all their friends over from the next valley and the other side of the mountain and musicians down in the holler and come on over, move all the furniture out of the way, make a big space in the middle of the kitchen, and everybody have a dance. And, uh, and that, that happened quite a lot. And if you're the fiddle player for that dance, you're a lucky person because you might have to walk 10 miles at, in the dark to get there and be part of the dance. And this nice little instrument, you could just tuck it under your arm. A lot easier than carrying a piano over the hills and mountains, right? So I'm going to play a tune that they might have played at one of those dances. And uh, you can imagine yourself being there, maybe tapping your foot, snapping your fingers. And I'm also going to sing a little silly verse to it. It's called Turkey in the Straw. And uh, sometimes people sing these tunes too. And I want you to help me on the chorus if you can. The chorus, you've heard it before. It goes, Turkey in the straw, ha, 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 that's your part. Turkey in the hay, hey, 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 that's your part. Run them up, pluck them up, play a little tune, sing a little song called Turkey in the Straw. So you're going to do the ha, ha, ha and the hey, hey, hey. I'll play it once and then sing a silly little verse and you help me with the chorus. Frogs had wings and snakes had hair and automobiles went flying through the air. Watermelons grew on a sweet potato vine. We'd have winter in the summertime. Turkey in the straw, ha ha ha. Turkey in the hay, hey hey hey. Run them up, pluck them up, play a little tune. Sing a little song called Turkey in the Straw. Let's try again. Turkey in the straw, ha ha ha. Turkey in the hay, hey hey hey. Run them up, pluck them up, play a little tune. Sing a little song called Turkey in the Straw. All right, we're going to say goodbye and play it out here. And uh, just keep that picture in your mind of dancing with your friends and your family and your musicians way back in the mountains on a beautiful Appalachian night. So long now. <laughs> Hi, I'm Molly Mason and I'm going to tell you a little bit about guitars. I love the guitar. I've been playing one since I was about 12 years old and I actually did my first learning of playing the guitar from public television. Once a week I had a little lesson on public TV. Um, I'm going to start by talking about something that led into the development of the guitar, a wonderful instrument. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. Uh, it's, the stringed music business started thousands of years ago in ancient Greece, and the lyra was a, a, an important instrument. It was a stringed instrument, most commonly I think having eight strings, making a beautiful sound. And it, it kind of traveled all around and got built by people in different countries. And it turned into an instrument called the lute, which had many strings. And that was found all over Europe. Uh, and then that kind of, that gave the name to luthier, which is the name for people who build and repair guitars. A luthier, that comes from the word lute, an ancient instrument that's like the, the um, 
I don't know, the, the great grandfather of the guitar, maybe? In the 1600s in, in uh, Spain, guitar started kind of coming into its own as a separate from a lute instrument that was more like what we know as the guitar today. But it wasn't until the 1800s that today's guitar with six strings kind of settled into what it was going to be for, for a few hundred years. And um, let's see, in 1830, a guitar company in our country, in the United States, started, and that is the Martin Guitar Company. And this is a Martin guitar. And they made a lot of um, many beautiful little guitars. You can look them up on the internet. Uh, they made parlor guitars, which were very popular in the 19th century, the 1800s. They were small guitars with a, a soft sound, uh, I think mostly played with fingers, and they were a wonderful home instrument for um, decades and decades of the 19th century. Um, the guitar as a, as a band instrument kind of started happening later in the 1900s in string bands around the country, accompanying fiddles and banjos and being part of a dance band. So that happened. In uh, 1902, so just over the turn of the next century, um, Orville Gibson, I'm looking at my notes here, so Orville Gibson started the Gibson, uh, the Gibson Company building mandolins and guitars, and they're still around today making both of those beautiful instruments. I have one of those too to show you. This is um, just a regular dreadnought is the name of this style of guitar with flat back and front and one round hole. And I'll show you the, um, the Gibson guitar that I have, which is a little different kind. You'll see that it has F holes, shaped like an F. It matches uh, the holes on a violin or a bass, a stand-up bass. And Gibson makes all kinds of guitars. This is only one of the kind of guitars that it makes. But they got used in jazz bands. <coughs> in the early day to accompany things. They, uh, they put the sound out there in a, in a loud and clear way. This one I think is from the 1940s, but they still make them today. So Gibson and uh, Martin are the two biggest guitar makers, I'm pretty sure, uh, acoustic guitar makers uh, in our country today. Before we go, I'm just going to mention some wonderful guitar players today. There's Doc Watson, who isn't with us anymore, but his recordings and his, um, his little movies are, so you can check him out. Uh, some other guitar players that you might want to look up and listen to are Clarence White, no longer with us either, but a beautiful, beautiful player. Tony Rice, same thing, he's gone now, but uh, an amazing picker. And, and the thing that really makes me feel great about today is there's so many women uh, flat picking, which means picking the melody. As opposed to chords. And um, a lot of women flat picking like crazy, just beautiful, amazing, fast stuff. That didn't really happen when I was a kid learning to play the guitar, but now there's so many wonderful ones. And I'm going to mention Molly Tuttle. She's pretty well known. Look her up. Another really well known person from the 1920s, playing on the radio, making records in the 20s, was Mother Maybell Carter and the Carter family. Mother Maybell was a great guitar player. She also played one of these uh, arch, arch top guitars with the F holes. And um, she did. Uh, picking of the melody as well as strumming of the strings, which was kind of like what I was playing when I did the intro. Mother Maybell was a, a real worker. She, she sang, she raised kids and taught them how to sing in harmony, and she uh, did performing all through the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and into the 70s. I actually recently looked um, on YouTube and saw her on an old Johnny Cash 
TV show from the 70s and she was singing and playing guitar. Pretty amazing, her career. So check out the Carter family and Mother Maybell. You know, you can't, you can't think of Mother Maybell Carter without thinking of Wildwood Flower, which was a hit of the Carter family and a thing that I think every guitar player since the 1930s has learned to play as first, second, or third tune. And it's usually done in C and it sounds like this. Hello everybody, my name is Billy Parker. I'm here to talk with you about the mandolin in Appalachian music. And I'm really excited to do that because the mandolin holds a, a very important place in Appalachian music. So one thing I'm gonna talk about is the different types of mandolins, different mandolin family instruments, and also maybe a little bit about the influence of the mandolin in the music. So the mandolin itself is related to uh, the oud and the lute and instruments from the 1300s. Um, it came to America in around 1850, where it was really primarily a parlor instrument, was played with instruments like a harpsichord and zither, and um, it looked like this. It had a round back, and some people call them a tater bug, because it looks kind of like a potato bug if you look at the back. In the early 1900s, a man named Orville Gibson uh, got an idea to change the shape of a mandolin. An example of one of his most famous mandolins is this model, this style. This is not a Gibson mandolin, but it's styled after the Gibson F5 mandolin. And if you can kind of get an idea of what it sounds like, that's a mandolin with a flat back. And it, you can see it has F holes as well. There's another type of mandolin that was made. This is actually a Kalamazoo mandolin, which was made by the Gibson Guitar Company. It was kind of their off-brand. And this one came from about 1930. As you can see, this also has a flat back and a round hole. And a very different tone. I'm going to talk with you about another instrument called the octave mandolin. This mandolin has the same four notes as the other two mandolins I showed you, E, A, D, and G, except these notes are an octave below the mandolin. So, as you can see, it's the same kind of sound, but it's at a lower register. This is a mandola. So, I'm gonna play this, and you'll notice it sounds different and sort of lower. Mandola. This is a mando cello. So if you think about the instrument cello, you know, that's played like this, um, this is tuned the same as a cello, which is an octave below a mandola. So. So they're all related instruments, and they all have a place in Appalachian music, mostly the mandolin, but really the mandola, the octave mandolin, the mandocello, they all play their part in the style of the music. In many of the songs that are played um, in bluegrass and old-timey American music are really of um, Scottish, Irish, and Welsh origin. Um, one of them is a song called Soldier's Joy that's a very popular um, and well-known Appalachian uh, inspired tune. So I'm gonna play a little bit of Soldier's Joy. 
uh, on a couple of these instruments. Hello, I'm Kathy Hollinsworth, and I live in the mountains of Southwest Virginia in a town called Christiansburg. And this is a hammered dulcimer that I'm going to show you a little bit about today. It wasn't too well known until it got a revival, sort of, in the 1970s, and then a lot of people started liking them and playing them. It's organized with lots of strings that go all the way across two bridges. There's a bridge you can see real well here and then there's another bridge over here that the strings that other strings cross. And the low notes are on this my right side and then when you move to the middle the higher strings cross that bridge and this bridge actually has two notes, one on the right side and one on the left side. It's played with hammers. These are called hammers. They're a little bit like the hammers inside a piano but these do not have felt on them, so when I hit the strings, it makes a sound and it lasts as long as it wants to. So what I'm going to do first is I'm, when I stand up, I'm going to play a scale so you can see how you play four notes on one side of the bridge and then you move over and play the other four notes. And then every time you are at one of these white marks, you can do that same thing. Then I'm going to play it a sort of a slow tune called Country Waltz. I'm just going to play it once through and then I'm going to go into the well-known fiddle tune Soldier's Joy and so I hope you enjoy that. So when I stand like this I'm holding my hammers so that they're like levers and I can do a scale alternating my hands and I hope you heard that that was a Do Re Mi scale from Do to Do. So I'm going to stop the notes from sounding, and first it's going to be Country Waltz, and then when it gets faster, that's going to be Soldier's Joy.
Thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoyed that little bit of the hammered dulcimer. Well, hello, my name is Ted Yoder. I am from Goshen, Indiana. I am presenting to you today the hammer dulcimer, which is basically the grandparent to the piano. So if you open up a piano, that's why you can, you'll see the strings going across the soundboard and a bunch of hammers on the, on the piano soundboard. Well, this is the same thing, it's just laid flat, and I only have two hammers to work with instead of 88. Now, most of the time with uh, hammer dulcimers, I didn't know there was such a thing as Appalachian music that you were supposed to play on a hammer dulcimer. So I came to it and uh, I started playing rock and roll on it because that's what I did on the piano. Um, before I get into that, the other thing is I'm going to show you some dampers here. It is worked by a pedal down here that you basically press with your, your foot and it pulls these dampers down on the strings. So. Typically, this is, uh, you have sustain with the hammered dulcimer, and the notes just ring out. If I put the dampers on it, it's kind of like on a guitar when you touch the string. So you can do it different ways, but this way it mutes the whole, the whole soundboard and you can have your two hammers going at the same time. So, when I came to the hammer dulcimer, this is kind of what I started to play. You can do some expressive stuff like that. Uh, you can do uh, rock and roll. If you want to hear more of my rock and roll stuff, you'll have to go to, uh, to YouTube to find that. Um, because we're trying to do some uh, non-copyrighted material on here. I'm going to play a very traditional, pretty traditional, um, uh, Appalachian tune for you called The Water Is Wide.
Hi, I'm John Hollinsworth from Christiansburg, Virginia, where I have a shop and I build custom auto harps. I thought I'd give you a chance to look at some of the parts that we build in the construction of the instrument. It starts out with a frame that's made of hard maple, a nice stiff, dense wood that can withstand all the string tension that it needs to from the instrument. Now there's several other parts that go on the frame. <clears throat> These parts are on the outside of the frame, which you see. This is a bent piece. You steam to bend that, and it takes on the profile of the instrument. The parts that I described are now glued onto the frame of the instrument, and it's starting to look like an auto harp. There's also some been, been some other parts of the instrument that has been cut away for acoustic reasons. Every instrument needs a top and a back. And this one has a nice walnut back and a spruce top. The inlay around the sound hole has been put in, but the sound hole has not been cut out yet. The auto harp also needs bridges which support the strings on both ends. <clears throat> the bridge also has to have a bridge rod that fits into the groove. After cutting the bridge uh, stock into several pieces. This three three different pieces for this one. It's re-glued and it now has the proper shape to fit on the instrument. We also need a cord bar set which is also comprised of several different pieces of wood. Two pieces for the body of the bar and one more piece for the button. As, as you can see the button fits onto the riser and the start, this is the start of a cord bar. The cord bars ride up and down on the cones, which is made of several different pieces of plastic, Delrin type material. Here's an auto harp that's almost complete, and you can see some of the parts that we described. Here are the cones, and they, have a, they also have a spring, and the cord bar. Remember the three parts of the cord bar. So they ride up and down on the cones with the aid of the springs. This instrument now has the tuning pins and the strings also installed. So on the, un on the cord bar that we described, it starts out with just a, a, a piece of felt that's glued to the bottom of the cord bar. But in order for that to make a cord, some strings need to sound and some strings need to be muted. So everywhere there's a, a notch, that string will sound. Everywhere there's not a notch, those strings will be muted. So every chord bar is, can, is different because each one makes a different chord. So now when I press down this chord bar, which happens to be an F, all the strings that are in the chord of F will sound. So there's the sound of three different chord bars. So what I'd like to do now is to go and get a completed instrument and play a simple melody for you. This is The Storms Are On The Ocean by the original Carter family.
Hello, I'm Kathy Hollinsworth, and I live in Christiansburg, Virginia, in the Appalachian Mountains of Virginia. And I'm going to be doing an unaccompanied ballad, which is a song that usually tells a story, and it's unaccompanied because there are no instruments playing along. And these songs came to America with the settlers from Scotland and Ireland. They're very much older than the 1700s when the settlers might have come. They're back in the 15 and 1600s in Scotland and Ireland. And people couldn't read, so these were sort of like the newspapers of the day. They might print them out on big sheets of paper and hand them out, but people mostly learned them from listening to each other. They would sing them around the house while they were doing work. Mainly, a lot of times, it was the women who sang the songs and kept them going, but also men. And this one is called The Devil's Nine Questions. Instead of telling a real story, it's more like a riddle song. And the devil is asking a woman or a girl who he calls the weaver's bonnie, because a bonnie lass is a pretty girl, and a weaver was someone who made cloth, and she was maybe the weaver's daughter or maybe his girlfriend. And the devil is saying, if you can answer these nine questions, and in the song there are only eight, if you can answer these nine questions, then you can belong to God. But if you can't, then you're going to have to come with me. So this is called The Devil's Nine Questions. Oh, you must answer my questions nine. Sing ninety-nine and ninety. For you're not God's, you're one of mine, and you were the weaver's bonnie. Oh, what is whiter than the milk? Sing ninety-nine and ninety. And what is softer than the silk? And you were the weaver's bonnie. The snow is whiter than the milk. Sing ninety-nine and ninety. And down is softer than the silk, and I am the weaver's bonnie. Oh, what is higher than a tree? Sing ninety-nine and ninety. And what is deeper than the sea? And you were the weaver's bonnie. Oh, heaven's higher than a tree. Sing ninety-nine and ninety. And hell is deeper than the sea, and I am the weaver's bonnie. Oh, what is louder than a horn? Sing ninety-nine and ninety. And what is sharper than a thorn? And you were the weaver's bonnie. Oh, thunder's louder than a horn. Sing ninety-nine and ninety. And death is sharper than a thorn. And I am the weaver's bonnie. Oh, what's more innocent than a lamb? Sing ninety-nine and ninety. And what is meaner than all mankind? And you were the weaver's bonnie. A babe's more innocent than a lamb. Sing ninety-nine and ninety. And the devil is meaner than all mankind. And I am the weaver's bonnie. Oh, you have answered my questions nine. Sing ninety-nine and ninety. And you are God's, you're none of mine. And you are the weaver's bonnie. So we're going to play a Bill Monroe song, one of his best known. It's called Uncle Penn, named after Uncle Penn, where he learned a lot about music when he was a young man. Here we go.
the band played a fiddle or a how it ring. You can hear it talk, you can hear it sing. I do want to remind you to check out the Ashokan Center online. We have music and dance camps there, and we have a bluegrass camp. And we have some that are uh, archived that are actually on the internet, and you can, you can still take a look at them. You can uh, purchase them. See what you think. It's uh, theashokancenter.org.